Well, good morning. Happy 7th of July. <laughs> when the 4th of July falls between two weeks, you get to pick which one you're going to celebrate at church. And we chose today because there was so much going on last week. We thought we would just continue and have another celebration this week. Amen? Amen. I'm proud to be an American. I'm, I'm thankful to God for our country and the freedoms that we have. And, of course, to all the uh, men and women who fought sacrifice our lives to give us what we have today as a country. We're thankful for that as well uh, this morning. Let me just tr uh, quickly check. We have any very first-time guests this morning? First time in our service? Alice, your first time? Thank you for being with us, Alice. <laughs> I'm kidding. Alice is the first time in a couple of weeks, but you got a first time we're with you? All right. Raise your hand. Raise a high. You gotta give a, You gotta come give a speech. Hurry up! No, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. Uh, he's gonna bring you a little card here. You got one there, Roger. We got one up here by Alice. Are you Are you two Are you two together? Are you two separate? Brother and sister. They're, they're separate. <laughs> they don't even like each other, <laughs> right? No, I'm kidding. All right, right over here. Thank you. Good deal. Good deal. Any over here? I miss any first timers over here. All right, this side. Hey, guys, over here, look at me. You need to work on it, all right? We got first-timers over here, no first-timers over here. Come on. I'm just teasing. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. All right. So if you're a first-timer, you just got a card. That card is just so we can connect with you. If you'd fill that out, what we'll do is we'll meet you after the service in the lobby, and we'll give you a nice gift to go home with. And just want to thank you for being with us. It's full of great, fabulous prizes. And uh, so, again, thank you for being with us. We just want to uh, give you our, our, our thanks that way and send you out that way. So we'll, we'll exchange that after the service uh, this morning. All right. Well, we are here today, and this is Red, White, and Blue Jeans Sunday. I always love when I get to preach in blue jeans. It's, my, it's like my favorite thing in the world. But uh, <laughs> I don't do it often enough, but I'm, I'm thankful for it. So, uh, of course, we're thankful for our country and uh, just looking forward to celebrating God together and just the fact that uh, we do get to live in a free country. And, uh, you know, it, it may not be what it once was, but today it's still the greatest nation on the face of the earth. And uh, we should be thankful for that, if nothing else, this morning. So let's do this. Let's have prayer. I know we got a few still trickling in, getting seats. So if you don't have one, let us know. We'll make sure you got them. But uh, let's pray together, and then we'll get moving with the rest of our service. All right? Let's pray. Father, we love you today. We thank you so much for your goodness. Uh, thank you for your blessing. Thank you for watching. Thank you for the, uh, the group that is gathered here today in your house, Lord, to worship you, to sing, uh, to praise, to pray, to preach, Lord, to uh, think about our country and the freedoms that we have and our responsibilities. Uh, and Lord, we just pray that you will bless our service. Meet with us. Uh, Lord, we thank you for our guests. We thank you for returning guests. Uh, we just thank you for all that you do here in our midst. We pray, Lord, that we'll please you with what we do today, everything we say and do, uh, that you'll be lifted up and magnified and that you'll be pleased with our service today. Now, bless uh, everything we do today. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. We are going to take five minutes. We've been doing this for quite a while, and I enjoy it. Sometimes it goes six or six and a half or seven because some of you ladies won't sit down. No, I'm kidding. It's not usually the ladies. It's just people. But uh, So uh, we'll take five minutes, shake some hands, greet someone, tell our guests hello, welcome them, use the bathroom, get a drink, whatever you need to do. Take that five minutes, do that, and then we'll come right back up and uh, get moving with the rest of our service together. Okay, so five minutes, go ahead, and uh, we'll see you back in just a minute.
All right, y'all good? Everybody get your hand shook? All right. If you got missed, I say it, it can happen, but hopefully not. So we're glad that you're here. Amen. I felt I told the I told the folks in the back I was I was racing the clock to get up here and I was just kind of waving. I said I feel like I'm running for office. I was, Vote for me. Hey. <laughs> and then these kids, they just like. Mm. I love the kids. They're good. I love it. It's all good. So, anyways, we're gonna celebrate uh, America today, and uh, we're gonna do this first. I I got our I got our team up here, and we're we're early. You guys can sit down for a minute if you'd like. We're gonna do something first before we before we're ready to sing. So, or you can just come to the back. It's up to you. Get out of the way is what we're trying to say. But uh, <laughs> I, I th actually, I think, um, I think we have a video, don't we? See, we, we change everything up for these services, and then the guy in charge doesn't know what he's doing and forgets. So, um, so how, is it, it's like a minute, I think, a minute or two video. Uh, so we'll show this video, uh, and then the video's over. We still have one more thing to do. So if you guys want to sit down, you can. It's up to you. We better keep Alicia up here, because if she steps down, she may fall and hurt her other arm. So we'll, we'll keep her up here, wrap her in bubble wrap. But uh, so let's show the video and then we'll come back and move forward with our service this morning. Give us a pulpit mic here. Uh, if you guys, some of my teenage boys are going to help me. If you guys want to go ahead and come forward, you guys are going to help me this morning. And uh, we're going to uh, start our, officially start, I guess you could say, our service off uh, with uh, some pledges here. And so we've got a couple of our teenagers going to help us lead the Pledge of Allegiance. And then, of course, the Pledge to the Christian Flag. And then we'll have the Pledge to the Bible as well. So uh, teenagers, use that microphone the best that you can. And uh, if you'll stand for this, please, we'll appreciate that. And then as soon as they're done singing, uh, I'm sorry, no, <laughs> you didn't know you guys were singing, did you? <laughs> Woo! They about had a heart attack. As soon as they're done leading us in our pledges, uh, we'll stay standing and we will sing uh, the first verse of Star Spangled Banner. There is a second verse. We won't sing it, just the, the main verse this morning. And then we'll let you be seated and hit, hit the kids up here after that. So uh, uh, Jacob's going to start us off with the Pledge of Allegiance. And, and so uh, if you'll stand, it looks like you already have already. And uh, we'll say the Pledge of Allegiance together and then go right into the Christian. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now for the Christian flag, I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands. One Savior, crucified, risen, and coming again with life and liberty to all who believe. We're going to do a pledge to the Bible. Right. Pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I'll make it a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I'll hide its words in my heart so I might not sin against God. The Star Spangled Banner. Oh, say, can you see by the 
the dawn's early light was so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there You see, you can cheer right there. That's a good song to clap after. Amen. Praise the Lord. I, uh, uh, again, I love our country. I love our freedom. And we are very blessed to live in this nation. And uh, thankful for that this morning. We're going to have all of our kids come forward. And we're going to have our kids' time together this morning. Come on up. Don't be shy. Don't be bashful. Don't be mean. Hi. <laughs> come on up. Come on up. Come on up. That ought to be a song. Come on up. Come on up. Hey. All right. Come on up. Come on up. All right. Got a couple more coming. Come on up. We got to get the means one up here still. Oh, there he is. He made it. All right. But uh, I'm kidding. <laughs> All right. For the very first time, I guess I should talk to you guys. For the very first time in the history of our Bible time with Pastor, we are going to have a guest song leader and she's going to teach you your brand new song for the month and well she'll run through it one time you listen to her and then you'll be able to know you'll know it the second time you'll be perfect and just right on okay so everybody put your hands together you ready for miss norma come on come on come on miss norma get your, you got your microphone Is that, you got your microphone you're gonna need it i mean i know you have a big mouth but we need we need to hear you anyways but I'm teasing. I'm teasing. All right. You can go in the middle? Okay. Just make sure you turn it on. Oh, we got some video. Am I on? Yeah, I guess I'm on. Okay. We're going to learn this song, Joy, and it's a really easy one. You can follow along up there. And when we do the J, I want you to raise yours up, your picture. When we do O, I want you to raise your picture. When we do Y, I want you to raise your picture. Okay? Can you do that for me? Do that for me? Okay, ready? It goes like this. Jesus and others and you, what a wonderful way to spell joy. Jesus and others and you, in the life of each girl and each boy. J is for Jesus, for he has first place. O is for others we meet face to face. Y is for you in whatever you do. Put yourself last and spell joy. Okay, let's all try it together, shall we? Can you do that with me? Ready? Jesus and others and you, what a wonderful way to spell joy. Jesus and others and you, in the life of each girl and each boy. J is for Jesus, for he has first place. O is for others we meet face to face. Y is for you in whatever you do. Put yourself last and spell joy. Great, thank you.
Next week's guest song leader is going to be, hold on a minute, let me just randomly, no, I'm kidding. We're going to do that. That's uh, Miss Nora chose that song. She's teaching the kids one of the kids' classes this month, and uh, she wanted to sing that song, and so we let her kind of, kind of, kind of learn learn us. So uh, we're glad for that. Okay, all right, kids. I know you all are sat down and comfortable, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to all to come around this way and look towards the cross. All right? Can you all spin around a little bit, and I'll come back here. There we go. Perfect. Good job. Hi. How are you? You good? <laughs> I know I like your dinosaurs. Those are cute. I love it. All right. Oh, we got a couple new faces I don't even recognize. It's good to have you guys. All right, good. All right, a couple return. I've seen you before. I know you. All right. All right, I want to show you something today. How many of you know what this is? How did you know? I'll turn it around now you can read it. This is a first aid kit. What's a first aid kit for? Go ahead, just yell it out. Helping. Helping people. Helping people with what? Health, okay. It's got, it's got gauze in here. It's got um, a clotting sponge. How many of you like blood? Yeah, somebody tells you, oh, cool, man. <laughs> Help you to stop bleeding. It's got some bandages and some scissors and all kinds of things. Now, I am not a doctor, and I am not a nurse, and I am probably the last person you ever want to help you with your health. But we do have some doctors, nurses, and things like that in here that would agree with me to say this. If you've got a wound, if you've got an injury, one of the things that can help you the fastest is a first aid kit. You can't always go to the doctor right away. You can't always get to the emergency room because it's far away. And somebody might have a first aid kit that say, hey, you cut your arm. Let me put a Band-Aid on that and stop the bleeding. How many of you this week, how many of you this week got a boo-boo? One. What would you do? A broken arm. A broken Okay, that's a little bit more than a Band-Aid, but okay, <laughs> all right. You got a boo-boo this week? Several of you did. Uh, somebody else. Where's, is Levi here? Levi's got, he didn't come up. Get up here, Levi. Come on. Hurry up. Run. Come on. Hurry. Hurry. I want to show somebody this. Hurry it up. Let's go. Man, you run like a grandpa. Let me see your foot. Where's your foot with your boo-boo on it? Let me see it. Take your shoe off, dude. Man. Hold that, hold that foot up for everybody in the world to see. Can you all see that boo-boo? Look at that nasty boo-boo. See that? Yeah. Oh, you put your shoe back on. Gross. You stay here. Don't go back. Stay here. You can finish up here with me. All right. You know how much you get him? I told him, I told him, I said, show me his boo boo. I said, wear shoes, that'll help. He's all got no shoes. Said, yes, you do. Anyways, all right, so we get boo boos from time to time. Now, I've got to tell you this story. How many of you know who Abby is? My daughter, Abby. How many of you know who Abby is? You guys know Abby? She's sitting right over here. See, Abby? I've got to tell you a story about Abby. When Abby was little, Abby's solution to everything was a band aid. We, had, we went through so many boxes of band-aids, it wasn't funny. If Abby was writing uh, her, pe her pencil and she was writing something for school and she messed up and had to erase it, she's like, oh, I need a Band-Aid. If she was walking in the house and bumped her elbow on the fridge, oh, I need a Band-Aid. If she was combing her hair and pulled her hair, oh, I need a Band-Aid. She would get Band-Aids for nothing. And, and you know what we had to do? You know what her mom and I had to do? We had to hide the Band-Aids. Because she went through them so fast, we couldn't keep enough Band-Aids in the house for when we really needed them. I want to tell you something about a Band-Aid, okay? If you truly have a cut, a Band-Aid's a wonderful thing. It, it helps stop that bleeding. It gets it nice to put some pressure on it, and it helps that blood not to go all over the place and stain everything. You can sit down if you want to, Levi. And, and, and a, so a Band-Aid's a really good thing, okay? Do you know what the Bible says? i got to tell you what the Bible says. Listen. The Bible says in Psalm 147, verse number 3, that Jesus heals the brokenhearted and mends our wounds. Now, we're not talking about a cut like, you know, your rock got thrown at you and cut you or you cut yourself with scissors. But, you know, let me ask you a question. Have you ever been hurt by somebody? Maybe they said something mean to you. Maybe they bullied you. Maybe they, maybe they made fun of you. Or, or maybe, maybe someone in your family uh, passed away and went to see Jesus and that hurt your heart. Here's what I want you guys to know, okay? Just like this first aid kit helps our physical wounds when we cut ourselves and hurt ourselves, Jesus says this, I will help you through all your problems. If you've got a burden, I'll help you. If, if you've got a heart that hurts, I'll help you. If somebody has hurt you and wounded you, I love you. And if nobody else ever tells you they love you, can I tell you this? Jesus does. 
Jesus does. And if you've got a hurt, if you've got a heartache, if you've got a burden, if you've got something troubling you, you can always take it to Jesus. And he's the best first aid kit you'll ever find. And he'll help you with all those troubles and all those problems. But you've got to take it to Jesus. Okay? And he promises in Psalm 147 that he'll heal our broken heart and that he'll mend our wounds if we'll let him do that. All right? So Band-Aid's good for blood. Jesus is good for a whole bunch of other stuff when we get hurt. All right? So remember that today, okay? If you got something troubling you, make sure you take it to Jesus, okay? All right, Riker, you got it? You got it? Yeah, yes, sir. Ah. Oh, yeah. I'll tell you what we can do. Let me show you how a Band-Aid works. Let me have one of your kids up here, and I'm going to hurt you. And we'll show you how a <laughs> Maverick's like, pick me, pick me, pick me, pick me. Jason, sorry. What's... You are two mosquito bites, and those can hurt sometimes, can't they? And sometimes we put some medicine on to help with those. Very good, very good. All right, yes, ma'am. What's that? Well, Band-Aids can't help with stitches. That's a big, that's a big thing, right? You're right. So there are certain things that can help, certain things that can't, but we know that God can help us with everything. And we're really thankful for that, okay? All right, kids, thanks for listening. I appreciate your time. Uh, you're going to head next door. you got your kids, uh, your teachers are waiting and ready and anxious and thrilled to help you. So make your way back. Miss Nancy's waiting for you back there, all right? You got another one? Oh, my. Oh, my. I got one there, too. Look. Man. <laughs> What do I? Not doing this either. We have one more quick video to show you, and then we'll read scripture and jump into our singing. Let's start with some scripture together this morning. We'll jump right into our uh, last few songs before we get into the message today. The Bible says this, if you read along with us this morning. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. The Lord looketh from heaven, he beholdeth all the sons of men. From the place of his habitation, he looketh upon all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashioneth their hearts alike. He considereth all their works. There is no king saved by the multitude of an host. 
a mighty man is not delivered by much strength. And horse is a vain thing for safety, neither shall he deliver any by his great strength. And we'll revisit the rest of that passage in a moment. spacious skies for amber waves of grain for purple mountains majesties above the fruited plain America America God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good last song we sing here together this morning it's got two verses uh, it's in your hymnal number 805 if you'd like to follow the uh, musical score it's a familiar tune and when you hear the tune you'll probably know it and then figure out what was that for we still have not exactly placed it but it's a familiar tune but this is a fantastic song as we close thinking about our country because it correlates very well to the fact that we are what we are because of God Amen. and if Amen. God's people aren't right we can't expect them to bless our land. And so we'll look at that thought this evening or this morning as we sing this last song. If my people's hearts are humbled. If my people's hearts are humbled, if they pray and seek my face, if they turn away. to Psalm 33, finish that passage out this morning we started reading earlier. Verse number 18 says this, church, read with me if you would. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy, 
to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waiteth for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us according as we hope in thee. Pastor failed. <laughs> Hold on. I, I didn't bring up the words. <laughs> What's the name of this song? I'll stand over here. Hang on a minute. Let me get these. Uh... <laughs> oh. Can somebody uh, tell a joke or something? <laughs> Sorry, guys. It's, it's my fault. Did you show me there we go. You me no, I got it now. I got it. Wow. along the shore of Galilee from clay he formed the healing balm that caused the blind to see while stones of wrath lay heavy in their hands he knelt to ride his mercy in the shed Jesus came set the captive free showed us by the way he lived the way we need to be oh love is more than words could ever say we must touch them with compassion to help them find their way how can we reach a world touch how can we show them christ if we never show them love just to say we care will never be enough how can we reach a world we never touch That's long since lost its way. We pride ourselves in being set apart. But we don't take time to touch a broken heart. Even if we find the time to care, would we take the risk involved in always being there? Everything they need so much. Sometimes the word of God can pass through just one simple touch. How can we reach a world we never touch? How can we show them Christ if we never show them love? Just to say we care will never be. security of friends but beyond the stained glass window the world is lost in sin and how can we reach a world we never touch how can we 
show them Christ if we never show them love. Just to say we care will never be enough. How can we reach a world we never touch? How can we reach a world? Amen. How many of you have ever used that phrase? My, you fill in the blank, is a hot mess, right? And we've looked at several topics uh, on that uh, phrase of hot mess. We've looked at our faith. We've looked at our family, uh, our schedule. This morning being fitting for the 4th of July celebration, uh, we're going to look at my country is a hot mess. The song we sang uh, that was new to us, the special we just sang a moment ago, was all geared really towards the message for the hour. Um, the, the country we live in, the, it's not too hard to look at and say it's a hot mess, okay? But I want to give us a biblical approach to this, and I want to carefully place blame where blame needs to be placed, <laughs> Let's put it that way, all right? So if you've got a Bible, we're going to go to 2 Timothy, chapter number 3. That is right after 1 Timothy. That helps you greatly, I'm sure. 2 Timothy, chapter number 3. And I want to read the first four verses, and then we'll pray. Uh, if you'll stand with me out of respect for the reading of God's Word, uh, we'll read these first four verses together. If you don't have a Bible, it's on the screen, or you can share with your neighbor. And we'll look at verse uh, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And like I said, then I'll pray, and you can be seated uh, this morning. 2 Timothy, chapter number 3. And look at uh, verse number one. Paul writes this, This know also that in last days perilous times shall come. And he doesn't use might come. He says they will come. And then now he goes on to explain why. Look at verse two. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parent, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, hell, uh, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Let's pray. You'll be seated. We'll jump right in. Father, we love you today. We thank you for the time we've had. It's been good to think about the great country that you allow us the privilege of living in. We thank you for our freedoms. We thank you for our nation, Lord. And while it's not what we wish it were, Lord, it's better than so many. And uh, we are just grateful for those men and women who laid down their lives so that we could have the freedoms that we do have. Uh, we ask you to continue to watch over our country, protect our country, bless our country, Lord, as we learn to truly uh, bless you first. And uh, Lord, we just ask you as we meet together now for the next few minutes, we open your word. Uh, Bless the preaching. Uh, may it be helpful. May it be challenging to us. Lord, may it be direct. Uh, but Lord, in a way that we open our eyes and see some things that we need to see this morning. 
Uh, Lord, use the message that you've prepared uh, to help us, to grow us, uh, to change us even, Lord, into what you need us to be as uh, your children, Lord, I pray. If there's one here that does not know Christ as their Savior or one watching us online, uh, Lord, we pray today would be the day they realize that you loved them enough to send Jesus to die on the cross for their sins. And if they would just trust you and turn their life over to you, uh, Lord, that uh, you would save them from their sins, forgive them, give them an eternal home in heaven and uh, enter them into the family of God. Uh, may that be their decision today, we pray. If other decisions need to be made, help us to make them today as well. And we ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. It doesn't take but a moment or two to realize how big of a hot mess our country is in. Uh, we are starting a little bit later into the message this morning than typical because we did a few extra things uh, at the beginning of our service. If you got your outline in your bulletin, you'll know it's a little lengthier than it usually is as well. So we're gonna, I'm going to talk fast. You all listen fast, all right? Sound good? If you don't look at what I'm saying, plug your ears. No, don't do that because then I'll, I'll point you out. But uh, no, but uh, so we'll, we'll get through this. So don't worry. But uh, uh, you look at our country, and it's very easy to look at, watch the news, uh, pick up a newspaper if they still exist. Uh, you know, any internet, whatever, and, and you see our country, you say, "Wow, we are a mess." Uh, we are not what we once was. We, we, we are not what we once were. We are not what it was when I was a child. You know, so many things have changed. It's a drastic difference in our land. You know, we could say, if we look at America today, I think we could probably say this. I think we're in crisis mode. Uh, you know, we, we look at that and you think about uh, the violence that, that has plagues our land right now that has increased crime, hatred, wickedness, uh, perversion, just, just flooding our country. Wars, terrorism. The media being controlled, uh, so we, we hear what they want. Uh, terrible politics plaguing our country. You know, you might call the last few years of our country because, uh, you know, a while back maybe it might not have been this, but you look at the last few years or so, and you might be able to say, man, our country's in a big crisis right now. We're in a hot mess, literally speaking. Of course, that hot mess, is that, that's that chaos, that out of control. I don't know how to handle the situation. Paul warns us in 2 Timothy chapter number 3, by the way, this is nothing new. Paul, Paul said this when he wrote this, and he said this, in the last days, perilous times shall come. Now, I want to say two things. First of all, I'm going to explain what perilous, time, perilous times means. But second of all, he says in the last days. I want us to be very clear on something this morning. I do believe we are living in those days Paul's referring to. I don't, I don't think we're long for this earth. I believe Jesus Christ is going to come back soon and take us out of this mess. Amen. And, and I'm praying for it. It can happen today. Amen. Just wait till after the ice cream, please, Lord. But I'm kidding. But uh, you know, I, I believe that. Okay. And Paul points to this. He says, in the last days, perilous times are going to come. That word perilous means dangerous. It means hard to deal with. It means savage. Savage. It's the same Greek word that is used to describe the maniac of Gadara that Jesus healed in the, in the graveyard. That same word is used there. Uh, that word suggests that the violence that will take place in the last days has a demonic force behind it. Okay? This violence isn't just happening. It's not just well, people are mean. There's a demonic force driving the violence and, and, and all the negative things that are taking place in our world today. In recent years, we've seen an increase uh, intensity in the characteristics of perilous times. We've seen increased intensity in what we would say this is savage or brutal or, or, or hard to deal with or dangerous. Uh, it's not because we have more people in the world. That's not why it's happened. It's not because the news coverage is better, and that's why we know about it. It's the fact that uh, evil has become deeper and deeper and deeper. Morality has declined and declined and declined. And because of the combination of that, we see wickedness abounding in our country, and we look at the United States of America, as great as she is, and we say, man, we are in a hot mess. Our, our country is hurting. I, I look at all that, and I say... The greatest crisis, though, in America, I don't think is found in all the things I just said. You look at the, 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 the crisis in America, and I want to challenge us this morning. I want to challenge us to look at this with a Christian and a biblical view. The, uh, uh, it, it, let me put it this way. I don't think our country is in a hot mess because of politicians and radical groups. I don't think our country is a hot mess because some wicked organizations banded together and decided to turn our country away. I believe with all my heart this morning, and you can argue with me if you want, there are disagreements and that's fine, but I think I'm right on this one. I think the problem that we've gotten to the crisis in America is not the corrupt politicians, it's not these liberal organizations that are promoting hate and division. I think the reality is this, we're in crisis in America because of the state of the church. 
I think we're in crisis in America today because Christians have failed to stand up for God, have failed to stand up for right. We've turned a blind eye to evil and to sin. We've allowed it to encroach even into our churches, and we just don't want to get involved because that's political. Hold wash. The Bible says judgment must begin at the house of God. The Bible says if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. I've got no right to pray for God to heal my country when I'm living a filthy, wicked, sinful life. I've got no right to say, well, God, it's the politicians. Give us new government. Give us new political leaders. Until God says, I say this to God, God, fix our churches. God, get the people behind the pulpit and the people sitting in the pew. Get their hearts right, God. And when that happens, we might just see a change in our country. It's time that we realize the crisis in America and the reason we're in a hot mess. And you don't want to hear this this morning. Churches don't like this. Christians don't like this. But it's time that we realized it's our problem. It's something we created. It's something where uh, 50, 60 years ago when the tide started to shift and started to change, Christians decided, oh, I can't get involved in politics. Uh, there's a separation of church and state. I'm going to challenge you. Go read the Constitution. Okay. First of all, that phrase isn't in there. And second of all, when it's referred to, it's saying that the state or the government has no business asserting themselves in religion. It does not say Christians need to stick their head in the sand and be, oh, hold on, man. I need, I need to calm down, man. <laughs> we stick our stinking heads in the sand and say, well, God's in charge. He'll just take care of it. You ever thought about putting feet to your prayers? You ever thought about getting active for the cause of Christ and just say, well, God's in control. He'll take care of it. Did you ever stop and think he uses us so much in this world to do so much of his kingdom work? Why would he not want us to be involved in other things so that he can use us for a vehicle of change? Amen. <laughs> See, the problem of our country being a hot mess, I'm sorry, it's not between uh, Democrats and Republicans. It's not in political systems. The, the, the solution for our country is not there either. It's found right here. It, it, it's found right here. <laughs> it's found in the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It's the only hope our country has. As we think about this morning, I want to take a very honest look at the hot mess our country is in and see what the cause really is. See why we're there. See what's gotten us there. Because I'm going to promise you something. Like, you can't look at a president and say, well, it's his fault. You can't look at the uh, uh, House of Representatives and say, it's their fault. The reality is this. If we're truly honest this morning, judgment's got to begin at the house of God. And we've got to realize that we've played a root cause as Christians in allowing some of the things to happen. You realize, don't, don't take this the wrong way. If you're a public school teacher, I'm not mad at you. I don't hate you. I, I love you. But you realize the mess our public school system has become? And some of you, some of you retired teachers say, yeah, you're right, I, I'm with you. And it's because Christians decided, oh, we don't have any rights because they said. No, and we've rolled over and we've played dead. And now we want to stand up and say, our country needs help. I need to be the vehicle of change. I need the one that God allowed God to use to help bring correction to the United States of America. My country is in a hot mess and I got to look in the mirror at who caused it. The church, Christians, not doing their part, has led us down a path of wickedness. I want to give you some crises that I think are taking place in America today from a biblical, a scriptural, uh, a, a Christian point of view. The first one I want to give you is the crisis of the unattended church. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, not forsaking the assembly of yourselves as some men or some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. As Christ's return comes closer and closer and closer, we're warned in Scripture, we ought to take the, the, the cause of Christ and the meeting of God's people together. Uh, it ought to become even more serious to us in nature. Far too many people regard church as a crutch or as a convenience. When I need it, it'll be there for me. Oh, when I need someone to talk to, they'll be there. The church should be far more than just a crutch or, or a convenience. It should be a mighty army that's moving forward with the banner of the gospel, helping people under the auspices of the kingdom of God instead of, well, I got a need, let me go to church. 
the unattended church. You can look around at churches today. Uh, we, we got a great crowd again this morning. We had a great crowd last week. You look around at a lot of churches today, and you're going to find 80% of the seats are empty. That's just how it is. People have stopped attending church. People who used to go to church for years. People whose, whose family were brought up in church, and they just stopped going. And it's caused a crisis in America. I, I'm going to give you, I'm just going to give you all three of these real quick, because none of them are, I'm going to sp 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 stick a lot of time on, because i got to hurry. i got like eight more points. There, there's three things I put down about the church. First of all, we need to attend the church. That's a no-brainer. You ought to be here. Amen? Yeah. This side agreed with me, you guys. Amen? Yeah. Thank you. All right, good. <laughs> now, I know there's sickness. I know there's work. I know you can't come every time. I get all that. That's not what I'm saying. But far too many people today just lay out of church because they're like, eh, eh, eh. Right? And I'm going to tell you this right now. When the parents treat church as optional, their yeah. children are treated as, not, as, as unnecessary. That's, that's how it happens. That's, that's a natural flow in the trickle-down effect. Attend the church. Defend the church. When, when's the last time somebody spoke ill of your church and you say, hey, listen, yeah. wait a minute. Yeah. What? That's not all. You, see, see, we all get lumped together many times. And you got some knucklehead churches out there doing some pretty stupid things. And so everybody said, well, that's the church. There's so many misconceptions about the church. When's the last time you stood up and said, let me tell you about my church. Let me defend the church. Let me tell you what it really is for. Let me tell you its purpose. And let me tell you what your purpose within it is. Yeah. Defend the church. How about recommend the church? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I don't want you to raise your hand. Please, please don't raise your hand. When's the last time you just simply said to somebody, hey, would you go to church with me? Some of you have guests here today. Some of you brought guests last week. Uh, some of you are really faithful about bringing guests all the time. When's the last time you just recommended that? And again, this, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I've, if you've met me, if we have personally had a conversation when you first visited, I probably said something like this to you. Jessica, you, you might remember this. I'm sorry, I put you. Come up here. No, I'm kidding. No, I'm kidding. I probably said something like this to you. This church isn't for everybody. I don't know if you remember this or not. <laughs> this church isn't for everybody. Come. If you like it, keep coming. If you don't, I'll check on you. If you say, leave me alone, I'll leave you alone. Because we don't want to force it. This isn't for everybody. But the reality is this. God is for everybody. Amen. Recommend church, whether it be this one or another one. Get people in church. That's where we meet with God's people around God's word, and we celebrate the things of God, and we grow corporately together in God. Amen. The crisis of the unattended church. By the way, too many people talk about what's wrong with the church instead of what's right with the church. Right. Uh, you know, for, uh, I'll come back to that one minute. <laughs> You know what's right with the church? I, I love the fact that the church ought to be fervent in spirit. Right? Uh, we, ought, we ought to love the things of God. Having a fervent charity among ourselves, First Peter says. We, we ought to just love God's house, love God's people, and when people come, we ought to love them as well. And when we leave the, the security of these walls and the stained glass windows we sung about a moment ago, when we leave this, we ought to love the people out there as well. Uh, the fervency of spirit, that's what's right about the church. I heard about one little boy years ago, he was shabbily dressed, and he decided he was going to go to church one morning. He walked for miles through the snowy streets of Chicago to attend Sunday school pastored by D.L. Moody. He got there, and one of the people asked him, man, you don't live near here. Why did you travel so far? Why didn't you go near a church, uh, uh, go to a church near your house? Why did you walk so far? That little boy looked at that man and says, because you guys love a person over here. You will find out very quickly when you step into the doors of the church whether they love people or not. What's good about the church? They love people. They're fervent in spirit. Christianity without love is lifeless and powerless. Uh, friendly in speech. Friendly in speech. We, we talk kindly to people. Amen? And by the way, let me just say this. Friendly, you, you can stand for right and against wrong and still do it in a kind way. Okay? And, and sometimes that's learning and sometimes it's a growth thing, but you can do it. Friendly in speech, fervent in spirit, faithful in service. This is where we come to just, just serve God, to give him our lives, to give him our hearts, to give him our talents and live for him. Everybody in the church is willing. Some are willing to do things and serve, and some are willing to allow you to do so. I want to get us all on the first side, amen? <laughs> I want to get us all on the willing to serve, willing to be, willing to do, willing to walk out these walls and represent the church in Jesus Christ. Uh, the church in crisis. The crisis of the unattended church. Number two, the crisis of the unbent knees. Yeah. Jeremiah 33, 3 says this, Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. 
I won't ask you to raise your hand or testify because I know the truth of this. How many times do we use prayer as an after the fact thing instead of a before it's needed thing? We use prayer as a last resort instead of the first option. We do it. Uh, God will supply everything we need, but we got to learn to take it to him. We got to learn to take it to him. First Peter 3, Jeremiah 33, Matthew 21, Proverbs 15, Matthew 5, Matthew 7. You see all these passages of Scripture that encourage us to go to the Lord with our burdens, with our needs, and with our prayers. The Lord, the Bible says in Proverbs 15, is far from the wicked. So that means if you're living for Christ, if you're a child of God, where should the Lord be? Near you. Near you. The, the crisis of unbent knees. I, I'm going to give you all these again. I'm just going to put them all up there, okay? I mean, you can write them down as you want to. When we fail to pray, here are some of the things we fail to pray for, our companion. Do you realize how important it is to pray for your spouse? Yeah. If for no other reason, because they have to put up with you. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. I'm not shut up. Sorry, my, uh, he's not in here, is he? You're, okay, your kids. I'm not allowed to say shut up in front of the kids anymore. I got in trouble a couple weeks ago. So. <laughs> Get the kids out, then we'll say the bad words. <laughs> right? Oh, Levi's in here. I'm sorry, Levi. My bad, buddy. Don't say shut up. That's a mean word. Huh? Fail, fail you to pray for our companion. And we wonder why we don't get along. Can, can, I just, can I just give you, this isn't a marriage, this isn't a marriage seminar, okay? I'd be the last one to give you one of those, okay? But, but here's, the, here's the truth. So many times I pray for God to change my spouse so that she's like what I want her to be so that I'll love her and enjoy her more when the reality is I need to be praying for God to change me because yeah. yeah. I'm the only one that, God, that, that I can change through God's help anyways, right? I can't change her anyway. But, but praying for God to change me, I might just learn, maybe she doesn't need to change. Maybe I was the problem all along. <laughs> Unbent knee, we don't pray for our good pen. Failure to pray for our children. Moms and dads, if you're sitting here today, and, and your children, especially now, let's say you have adult children and grown children, you still should pray for them, okay? Don't get me wrong. But, but if your children are over in that building or over there, I'm going to tell you something. You better be on your knees regularly praying for those kids. They have got so much garbage to sift through in their lives that you and I did not have to sift through or weren't aware of it if it was there. Uh, they've got so many things that they've got to deal with that you and I don't understand and di what didn't go through necessarily in our lives. You better pray for your children. And by the way, don't pray, oh, I want them to be just like me. No, don't do that. I I'm going to pray that they'll have everything I didn't have. No, don't pray that. Pray that God will put them in the position to be exactly what he wants them to be. That they'll turn out to be exactly what he has in store and in plan for their lives. You better pray for your children. You, you, we're going to get to this again here in a minute, but you know why America has gone down the path has gone down to? Because we've seen generation after generation after generation not raising their children in the things of God. And so now not being godly is more popular than being godly. Pray for your children. Uh, when, we don't have, when we have unbent knees, we, we fail to pray for the church. You realize this this morning. You, you don't see this, many of you. Many of you don't. You realize how under attack the church of God is today? And he might not, you know, in the middle of the service, cut out our electricity, although he's done that before. You know, <laughs> it might not be that kind of attack, okay? But here's the reality. Your church is made up of families. And so what the devil does is he tries to attack the family because if he can pick off a family and a family and a family, all of a sudden he's greatly hindered and, and, and hampered and damaged the church. Yes. This is why we pray for our spouse, our companion, and our children. Why? Because we make up the church. <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a building. It's a group of people. Amen. Pray for your church. Uh, your church needs prayer, amen? <laughs> through everything it has to go with, through the pressures of life, uh, through sin, through society, through governmental regulation, everything that goes on, pray for your church. Pray for your church. Pray for your country. When we don't bend our knees in prayer, when we don't talk to God, many times one of the things we fail to pray for is our country. See, see again, we, we, don't, we don't reserve the right to complain and gripe about it if we're not going to do something about it. And the least we can do about it is pray. Pray. The crisis of the unbent knee. Um, let me give you number three. Number three. The crisis of untrained children. 
Proverbs 26 says this, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, I'm going to be very clear this morning. My children are far from perfect. My children are not, let's put them on a pedestal, and your children need to be like my children. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. The goal for our children ought to be, I want them to be what God wants them to be. I want them to accomplish what God wants them to accomplish. I'm not going to compare them to anybody else's children. The problem in America today is the crisis of untrained children. Little Johnny rules the house. Little Susie gets what she wants, period, end of discussion. The conduct of some children today, it, uh, it manifests the fact that their parents sailed out on the sea of matrimony without a paddle. <laughs> now, I understand there's not an instruction manual for children. I get it, okay? And every child is different. If you have, many of you in this room, you have more than one, okay? Everyone is different. And you've got to learn to discipline and to train and to teach every one of them in a different way. And it's a challenge for, for parents. It, it, it's hard. I know that. But we've got to try. Yeah. We've got to put effort into it. And when there's not an instruction manual that says, here's how you do this, we, we, we do at least have this. We do have this, and that'll guide us. That'll lead us. That'll help us. The, somebody said this once. I don't, I don't know who to give credit for, but they said, the modern house is one where a switch regulates everything except the children. Yeah. <laughs> now, I'm not saying go cut a switch and beat your kid. That's all I'm saying. But some of you grew up, and you had to cut your own switch. How many of you remember them days, right? <laughs> yeah. I, and again, I'm not saying that that's the, but the reality is this. Discipline for our children is extremely important. And I'm not, I'm not even saying the type of discipline. Whatever works for each different child I know is different. But the reality is there has to be consistent yeah. discipline. Yeah. Consistency. Because they know when they can walk all over you and when they can't. Yeah. Uh, discipline with our children. They, they teach three R's in school. Or at least they used to. I don't know if they do it anymore, right? It, it doesn't make sense because they don't all start with R. But reading, writing, arithmetic, right? And those are the three R's of schooling. You know, there's, there, there's three R's for the home as well. Let me give them to you. I'll give them all to you real quick. The first one is respect for authority. Our children need to be taught to submit to authority. Here's the hard part about that. I don't like to submit to authority. <laughs> so, so it's hard to teach my children that, right? And I'm not talking about, oh, boss me around. I thought, you know what I'm saying. Have you, have you heard kids today and the way they talk to their teachers or, or, or to their parents sometimes, or, or to somebody in a grocery store, or the, the server at the rest. And you're like, dude, if you were, yeah. if you were my kid, you couldn't finish that meal because you, your teeth would be on the ground. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm being silly. I'm not promoting beating your children. Don't get me wrong. But <laughs> respect for authority is a common thing that's missing today in our children. Yeah. Oh, most of you in this room probably got brought up saying please and thank you. Yes, sir, and no, sir, and yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am, and held the door, and, and things like that. And you had some manners, and, that and And you look at many of today's kids, and they're not being taught that. And we wonder what's wrong with our country. Because those are the ones that will eventually be future leaders, amen? <laughs> and by the way, you, you, want to hear, you want to see something scary? Turn on, turn on one of the TV channels, all right, one of the news channels, and watch these people that are protesting and rioting uh, about things that they don't believe are right, and they want change. And you watch some of the irresponsible uh, people that have been raised that have no respect for authority. Yeah. That's, that's where we're heading. Yeah. Respect for authority. How about this? How about responsibility for their actions? Yeah. But this is good for adults too, not just our children, okay? We need to take responsibility for our actions. Nobody makes us do wrong. Nobody makes us sin. Nobody makes us. We choose whether to do it or not. Yeah. And then we say, well, if my parents wouldn't have chained me to the water heater when I was six... Now, I hope that didn't happen to you, but you see what I'm saying? We, we pass the buck real fast. Well, I'm not responsible for my actions because somebody else. No, 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 no. I am responsible for me. When I stand before God, I'm going to answer for me. Nobody's going to answer for me. It's going to be me and me and him, me and him alone. Responsibility for actions. How about restraint in their appetites? How about teaching our children today discipline? Just, I know you want that, but is that the best thing for you right now? I know you'd like to take out that $75,000 loan to buy that sports car. 
But is that the smartest thing to do when the interest rate is 9.5% and, and you're going to pay back 112000 instead of seven? Is that the smartest thing to do? But I want it! <laughs> Restraint in your appetites. By the way, this one will help parents as well because we struggle with it sometimes too, okay? Teach our children these things. Teach them to realize you may want it, but if it's not appropriate at the time and it's not affordable at the time or it's not right at the time, then you learn to wait. Uh, restraint and appetites. Let me give you number four. Number four, I got to hurry. Oh, my goodness, it's late. Number four. <laughs> you want me to keep on preaching? All right, all right. <laughs> How about the crisis of the unread book? Second Timothy says this, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. We could stop right there. It's profitable. Profitable. Doctor and proof, correction, instruction, and righteousness that the man of God may be perfect through the first and all good works. The word of God is profitable. But how many times, just like prayer, is this the last resort when decisions need to be made in our lives? Should be the first. The crisis of the unread book. I'm going to give you all four of them again. All right, you can write them down. <laughs> I could say them all as one thing. <laughs> Love the book, learn the book, lean on the book, live the book. It's pretty basic. The more I'm in love with this, the more I want it to affect my life. The more I'm in love with this, the more I allow it to change my life. The more I'm in love with the Word of God, the more I realize the change I need to make, I can, I can base on the Word of God, not on what somebody told me. Amen. Not on what the preacher said. Amen. But what the Word of God said. Yeah. And then we learn to not just be hearers of the Word, but be doers only, and we live the book. We live the book. The Bible must be in our head, our heart, our hands, and our home. The Bible. I heard about a man, he owned a vineyard, and uh, he was very wealthy, and uh, he was uh, very secretive about his wealth and all the type of thing with his children, but the boys knew that they would inherit the fortune when the dad died, and he was on his deathbed, and he told his sons that the secret to his wealth would be found in his vineyard. And the boys decided, hey, if that's where the, the secret of the wealth is, let's go dig up the vineyard. And these boys went and spent weeks and weeks and months and months digging up, being careful not to damage the vines, but, but digging up every area of the vineyard looking for this buried treasure. Over the course of time, they dug up every inch of that vineyard and they discovered nothing. That fall, the vineyard produced the finest crop of grapes ever on record. They realized what their wise old father had done. He had forced them to stop loafing around, waiting for somebody to give them something. And instead, they cultivated the vineyard. The secret to his wealth was in the vines, properly cared for, and that would keep them rich and wealthy for many, many years. Our heritage, too, is priceless. But it will not yield its wealth to us without work. We've got to cultivate some things. We've got, to, we've got to open the book on a daily basis. We've got to spend time with God in a relationship on a daily basis. Our country's in the position it's in because Christians have neglected the things of God. Yes. The crisis of the unread book. Let me give you number five. Number five, the crisis of unconfessed sin. The Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 1 that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Unconfessed sin hinders and hampers the spirit of God's work in our life. Unconfessed sin hurts the ministry of the Christian. Unconfessed sin blocks the channels of the blessings of God. Psalms talks about how when there's sin in our life, he will not hear us. Oh, what right do I have to ask God for something when I'm living in a way I shouldn't be living in and say, oh, by the way, I'd like for that. When's the last time your kids disappointed you? Think about it for just a minute. Right after they did something that they knew was wrong and it was, they knew it caused great pain and disappointment, and you were disappointed, did they come up and go, oh, by the way, can I have a popsicle? No. Probably not. And if they did, you would say, I'll give you a popsicle. <laughs> right? <laughs> some time and some healing and some forgiveness had to take place before you were willing to offer a popsicle, right? God says the same thing. Why should I hear your prayer? Why should I pour out the blessings of heaven? Why should I give to you? When you're living in a way that you know is contradictory to what I want. Unconfessed sin. I want to give you three, three thoughts here real quick, okay? Uh, private sins, public sins, presumptuous sins. Yeah. Let, let me say it this way. Uh, private sins, of course, those are the things nobody knows about. We hide. Nobody will ever. And what we fail to remember is God sees everything. The eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. 
public sins. Those are the sins I, I'm, I'm, I'll, 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 you know, be proud about. I'll just walk out and say, I'm this and I'm doing this and I don't care what you think about it. Hey, look, and, and we relish and we revel and we have fun in our sin. That's a problem. But, but how about presumptuous sins? Presumptuous sins. These are, let, let, let me put it to you this way. These are things, okay, l- l- let me read right up here. The failure of many Christians today lies not so much in doing what he knows to be wrong, but in not doing what he knows to be right. Yeah. The sins that of knowledge, I know I, I know I shouldn't do this, but I do. Those are very dangerous. But the sins of ignorance are more numerous. Well, I know I should, but... So it's not, you know, I'm, I'm, I know I... It's, Thou shalt not kill, I'm going to go kill somebody. It's not that. It's when I know I should do something, and I just choose to neglect that. I choose to ignore it. Sin needs to be quickly confessed. Because here's what happens. If I don't quickly uh, uh, confess my sin, it becomes easier to defend. Yeah. It becomes easier to rationalize. You realize you can rationalize anything if you think about it long enough? Anything. Anything. That includes sin. And when we live with unconfessed sin, it's going to be really hard for the, the church to make a difference in the country. It's definitely going to be hard for the country to be what it needs to be with unconfessed sin, but uh, we know that's there. But are we doing our part? Let me give you the next one, number six. Number six, I've got to hurry. <laughs> the crisis of unfaithful living. Titus chapter 1, verse 16. They profess that they know God. Uh-oh. By the way, don't, don't get mad at the preacher. I didn't, I didn't write this. <laughs> Okay, I didn't write this. They profess that they know God, but in works, they deny him. Yeah. Being abominable and disobedient unto every good work, reprobate. Yeah. A mother wanted her son to take tuba lessons. The father was greatly against it. <laughs> the mom and dad argued back and forth for days, and finally the husband said, All right, listen, I will agree he can take tuba lessons. But does he have to practice? <laughs> now, I said that to lighten the mood. <laughs> but here's the truth. There's a lot of Christians that profess yeah. Yeah. to be a Christian. But they don't practice it. Right. Oh, I know God. I'm a child of God. I go to church. And then somebody says, you do? If that's the response when you tell somebody you go to church, yeah. you do? You're professing to know God, but your works, you're denying Him. Yeah. Yeah. We, we've got to live a faithful Christian life if we're going to make a difference for Christ. We talked about uh, sinful living already. We, we won't beat a dead horse there. That's unfaithful living. Uh, self-centered love. Yeah. If it feels good, do it. That's the philosophy of our day. Every man in Israel did that which was right in his own eyes. And when we self-center our love on what do I want, what do I get, how does this affect me, it's the wrong type of love. It's the wrong type of love. And it's unfaithful to the cause of Christ. Shameful lives. Shameful lives. Uh, Titus chapter 2, uh, verses 11 through 14. If you read through that, we won't do it just this morning for time, but it talks about how we live ungodly practices and worldly living, and, and we put those things into our lives as children of God and the damaging effect that it has. It's like the teenager that got pulled over by the police officer and he said this. You're using hand signals and your hand signals are very confusing to me. You remember when you used to have to use hand signals? And he said, uh, uh, your hand signals are confusing to me. Thus, they're confusing to other drivers. You put your hand out as you're going to turn left, but then you turn right. Doesn't work that way. And I thought this. Too many Christians profess one thing, but they act another. I'm going left, but then they act like they're right. <laughs> I, I'm doing. And when the actions don't match the words, this is where we get the whole, I don't go to church, I don't follow God, I'm not into that stuff because of a bunch of hypocrites. Yeah. Faithful living. Faithful living. Uh, Vance Havner said this once, we have too many noun Christians <laughs> and not enough adjective Christians. <laughs> I am a Christian. How about this? How about we be a Christian? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Hey, you listen, church. You aren't just the church. Here. Be the church outside of here. Yeah. Yeah. Be, 
be, be the one that points somebody to Christ outside of here. Be the church. Be the church. Unfaithful living. Let me give you the next one. Uh, the crisis of, of, of unconcerned witness. Acts chapter 1, verse number 8. You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost come upon you. You shall be witnesses. And that tells us where. Everywhere. <laughs> Everywhere. Uh, witnessing, telling people about Jesus, sharing the gospel, is every Christian's responsibility. Every Christian. Our country's in the shape it's in because we stopped telling the gospel to people when they said, oh, we don't want to hear about that. Oh, we got a no soliciting sign on our door. Don't tell me about Jesus. Listen, lady, I ain't here to sell you nothing. I'm here to give you a gift. Amen. I ain't soliciting squat. Amen. Well, people get offended when you talk about Jesus. I'm sorry. If I remember scripture correctly, he was reviled and despised and hated, yet he did it willingly and hung on that cross and stayed there for us. I think it's okay if somebody gets offended when I talk about Jesus. Amen. I got to listen to them talk about all their garbage. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Unconcerned witness. Let, let me tell you what a Christian here and a witnessing Christian does. Okay. First of all, it's somebody who's seen the miracle of salvation. If God has changed your life, it ought to come naturally you want to tell somebody. Now, you might not have all the polished words and a presentation and three points in a poll. I don't care. If God has miraculously changed your life through the gift of salvation, naturally you should want to tell somebody else. Do you, hate, do you have to hate somebody so badly not to tell them about Jesus? Think about that for just a minute. The miracle of salvation ought to cause me to witness. You say, well, I can't talk. I don't know what to say. I don't know how. How about this? How about we learn this? In the area of witnessing, I speak through the power of the Spirit. God gives me the words to say. The Holy Spirit lays verses into my heart that I couldn't even remember that I remembered. <laughs> and, and I just share with somebody what God has done for me through the power of the Holy Spirit. A witnessing Christian is, uh, is concerned. Uh, is somebody who stands for the message of the Savior. I, here's the thing. And I've been saying this for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, and I'll keep saying it. Christianity is not about a religion. Amen. It's not about a church. It's not about a denomination. It's about a person named Jesus. Amen. And the sooner we realize that the relationship with Jesus is what brings it all together, Amen. the easier it is to tell people about him. <laughs> well, I wasn't brought up Baptist. I don't care. It ain't about a Baptist. Do you realize that the gospel is not a Baptist gospel? or a Pentecostal gospel, or a Lutheran gospel, or a Methodist gospel, or a Church of God gospel, or, or a Episcopalian gospel, or a Methodist gospel, or... You realize there ain't going to be none of them people in heaven? There ain't no Methodists in heaven. There ain't going to be no Pentecostals in heaven. There ain't going to be no Church of God in heaven. There ain't going to be no Baptists in heaven. Oh, what well, pastor, what well, heresy are you speaking? <laughs> you know it's going to be having a bunch of people who realize they were a sinner on their way to a devil's hell, but Jesus died to save them from their sins. They repented of their sins, turned to Jesus Christ, gave him their heart, and allowed him to lead them, and they put all their faith and trust on what he did for them on Calvary 2,000 years. Those are the people that are going to be in heaven. Right. Born again, blood-bought children of God. Right. There ain't going to be no labels. And a concerned witness will stand for the Savior. Let me give you this last one. Number, number eight. Wow. Woo. I, I gave you the whole wagon today, all right? I didn't just give you a couple scoops. The crisis of the uncommitted life. Romans chapter 12. I seat you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things shall be added unto you. The Christian in today's society, in today's church, has become uncommitted many times in their lives. I'm going to give you all three of them here. Sometimes they become uncommitted in serving. Well, I used to serve God, but... No, no, there should be no but there. Okay? It doesn't matter your age, uh, health, I know it's a place in some... But everybody has something they can do to serve God in some way, some capacity. And as the body of Christ is formed, everybody plays a role and a function. But sometimes we get uncommitted to that. Ah, somebody else can do it. Ah, I'll watch somebody. You know, you know the most famous person in the church? Somebody else. <laughs> somebody else will drive the bus. Somebody else will take the offering. Somebody else will teach the class. Somebody else will, right? Somebody else is a bad dude, man. He does everything. 
Don't, 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 don't become uncommitted in serving Christ. Find you something to do and just serve till he calls you home. Uncommitted in singing. You say, well, pastor, I can't carry a tune. I'm not talking necessarily just about literal singing, although I think you should sing praise to God. Amen. You should, even if you can't carry a tune. Amen. Just let it, let it rip to the guy behind you. And goes, could you take it down a little? It's all good. It's all good. But I'm not just talking about singing in church. I'm not just talking about singing the hymns and stuff. I'm, I'm talking about singing the message of Jesus Christ faithfully with our lives and an uncommitted in sowing. The Bible tells us we reap what we sow. You realize that some people aren't going to reap much because they don't sow much. We become uncommitted in sowing. Uh, that's giving the gospel. Uh, that's giving our finances. Pastor, you're not supposed to preach on money. Hey, what is it? We're going to talk about my finances are a hot mess because I think every one of us could benefit from that. Amen? Amen. Hey, thank you, preacher. I appreciate you caring about my life. You're welcome. <laughs> I thought about our talents. All right? Our time. Sowing. Sowing. America is in a state of crisis. You look at our country and you say... Man, it's a hot mess. We read about it. We see it. The times are perilous. They're dangerous. It would be wise if we realize this as a Christian. The reason behind it all is not governmental. It's not systematic. The reason behind it is spiritual warfare. The reason the country's in the shape it's in is because for years Christians have backed off and said... God's in charge. I'll just let him handle it. And we've sat in our place and done nothing. Unfaithful lives, uncommitted lives, unread book, unbent knee. We can go through all the things we just talked about, all eight of them. You want to get the country out of the hot mess that it's in? It's time that judgment begins at the house of the Lord. Don't just go to church. Be the church. God can bless America again. But it's high time that we realize we need to start blessing God first. And maybe instead of in our prayers, uh, God bless America, maybe we should start praying, hey, America, bless God. America, bless God. Country's a hot mess. Can we do anything about it? Absolutely. Get involved. Pray for it. If there's a spot opens up in, in some sort of governmental uh, opening that you think you're qualifying, jump in, man. I'm going to tell you something. The government is not going to get hurt from more Christians getting involved. Amen. And the very few times you hear about uh, one of our representative or politicians that's actually Christian, you know, that it's, it's refreshing. Get involved. Pray for your country, if nothing else. But realize the shape it's in is not because of government. It's because of the shape of the church. And let's be the church that pushes the country in the right direction. Let's be the Christian that moves the country and swings the pendulum towards the things of God instead of to the wickedness and perversion of our world. Country's in a hot mess. Can we do something about it? I think we can. I think we can. Let's do our part. Father, Lord, I pray that you will take what has been said. I pray that you'll use it to help us. Lord, I know it wasn't a uh, comforting message. It wasn't a uh, feel-good message. It's a message that really, I think, should challenge our hearts and open our eyes. Lord, the struggle in our country, the reality is it's, it started when, when Christians started turning a blind eye, started rolling over, started not standing for right and for, and for Christ. And Lord, we are where we are because the church is in the situation it's in. Lord, I pray that you'll help us as Christians to see the need Help us to step up to the plate. Help us to be faithful for the cause of Christ. Help us to do our part in reaching others with the gospel and sharing the love of Christ with people. God, please, uh, we ask you to bless our country, but before we do that, we ask us as a country, as Christians, as churches, may we bless you first. May we do our part so that you have no problem doing yours. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed this morning. Just a brief invitation. I'm not going to ask this morning if you're, if you're saved or unsaved. I'm not going to, that's not the question I want to ask this morning. The question I do want to ask is this. Do your eyes and your ears and your heart and your mind and your soul and your spirit see the need of Christians to be Christians in our country? To be the church, to live it out, to live your faith out in the world so that they see the Christ that you represent and that has changed you. How's our relationship with with the church, with the Bible, with prayer, with each other? 
How are we doing? Because that's the measuring stick. How am I doing? How am I doing? America's in crisis. But will I do my part? Will I be and do what I need to? We're going to stand just a moment. We're going to sing just a, a closing song. Change my heart, oh God. Again, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray. It's got to start here. And if I won't deal with sin in my life, I can't ask God to bless my country. If I can't get committed to living for Christ, I, I have no right to ask God to bless my country. If I can't stand for right and share the gospel, I, don't, I can't ask God to protect our land. Will I do my part? That's the question I posed to you this morning. Will you be what you need to be for the cause of Christ? In the midst of a sinful world, will you be the light? Will you be the light? Father, Lord, you know our hearts and our minds and our needs. You know where we struggle. Lord, we pray as we sing this closing song, we pray that you truly will change our heart, open our eyes, guide our steps, direct our lives, and may we truly be good representatives for Christ in the midst of this world. And maybe, 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 if enough of us Christians get involved in doing these things, we might just see the tide in our country turn towards right. Help us, God, to have a burning desire that keeps us on fire for living for you so that we can make a difference in this world. And we can see a country that's a hot mess cool down, get some order, and follow uh, right instead of wrong. Lord, please help us to do our part. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning as we close? Change my heart, oh God. We'll sing a verse or so. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. You are the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me. This is what I pray. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. Amen. If you'll be seated for just a brief moment, Kathy's going to come make some announcements, and then we will be dismissed this morning. I hope you still have your worship folder out. There are so many announcements to take a look at. We have a busy, busy month. Uh, first of all, the Pizza Palooza. Uh, that was scheduled for today has changed just a little bit. Notice that it's, uh, it's actually family style. And uh, kids and their families are invited to stay for pizza in the fellowship hall right after church and, uh, and then also a build your own Sunday for dessert. That can't be all bad. So uh, <laughs> plan to stay with your, with your teens and, and kids for the pizza palooza. And then the swimming uh, party that it was talked about last week is going to be on August 4th. So ladies, um, we've been invited to come to Heidi's house on Thursday, July 11th for a swim party. Thank you, Heidi. We're going to have a swim party at 5, uh, barbecued ribs and, and a 6 o'clock dinner. If you'll bring a side dish to go with uh, that, uh, it'll be a wonderful time of relaxing and fellowshipping. And we thank you again, Heidi, for inviting us. Uh, the, the buffet lunch, this is for a group of uh, widows and widowers that meet at R&R. And divorce. Okay, widows, widows, widowers, and divorce, uh, in other words, singles, uh, can meet at R&R &R Pizza at uh, 1130, and they're going to be meeting until 2 o'clock, and that's going to be uh, on the second Saturday of each month, so it's coming up for you. Uh, also, our business meeting is going to be coming up on the 17th of July. Uh, it's a, going to be our second quarter business meeting, and you'll want to be here for that. We'll take a look at the second quarter finances. The men's breakfast, you know the routine on that, guys. Meet at the Fellowship Hall, 8 o'clock on Saturday the 20th. Uh, bring some food and eat and have fellowship, I guess. Uh, Friday Fellowship. 
There is uh, going to be another Friday fellowship on the last Friday and the 26th at 6 o'clock. Uh, but we need a host to do that. And there's a sign-up sheet out in the lobby. So um, consider that. It can be in your home or it can be here at the fellowship hall. So either way, it, w it will work. Uh, deacons and trustees, you meet this Tuesday, 5 o'clock at the church office. Uh, your devotionals are in the lobby. The uh, Baptist Bread little devotional booklet is there. Pick yours up. It's for yours to. It's for you to keep, and it's a nice little devotional book for you. Also, uh, be sure and be here at six o'clock this evening for our connection groups, and seven on Wednesday. All right, we're gonna uh, I'll turn this one off. We're gonna get dismissed here. Again, remind our parents and their kids and the teenagers, we're going to go next door to eat, so don't forget about that. If you uh, come over there and you are above the age group, we will kick you out, but uh, I'm kidding. You know who you are, so we'll look forward to that. So uh, let's, sing, uh, let's sing God Bless America. We'll be dismissed, all right? All right, y'all stand with me, and we'll get out of here, all right? Now we're going to sing an acapella, pickle, so you got to sing louder than me, all right? <laughs> here we go, ready? God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans white with foam. God bless America, my home sweet home. God America, my home, sweet home. Amen. God bless you. Shake a couple hands on your way out, and look forward to seeing you this evening.